Hello, my name is Shane Clark, and I'm doing this macroeconomics video presentation on looking at an alternative theory as to why the Great Depression was fixed. So while looking to do this project, I really wanted to do it on the Great Depression, as this and World War II have always been probably the two most interesting things in history for me. And I, I think it was really important for me to talk about this topic because, like I said, it's very interesting to me. The original idea I had was to compare and contrast whether or not the war itself or economic policy beforehand actually fixed the Great Depression. But while doing research, I came across an alternative theory, which is what we'll talk about throughout this presentation. So here in this picture is a group of people standing outside of stores, lining up to try and buy items due to rationing or whatever was going on at the time. And I have a quote here at the bottom of what this theory will actually talk about. The Depression was actually ended and prosperity restored by the sharp reductions in spending, taxes, and regulation at the end of World War II. And I thought this was personally really interesting to me to, to talk about this specific topic for my video presentation because it kind of is different than what we've learned in class, but it still uses the same like economic principles and theories as to what we've learned to understand it and kind of interpret it. And I think that while I may not agree with everything that this theory proposes, I think it makes a lot of sense. So as we continue, we'll talk about that and a couple other things. So thank you. So to correctly preface what we'll be talking about throughout this project, we're going to have to give a little bit of background on the Great Depression. So here's a brief overview of the next few slides of what happened and kind of how the Great Depression unfolded. So first, throughout the 1920s, the U.S. economy expanded rapidly, and the nation's total wealth more than doubled between 1920 and 1929, a period dubbed the Roaring Twenties. This kind of set up what would be reckless speculation in the stock market, where everyone from millionaire tycoons to janitors poured their savings into stocks, and as a result, the stock market began to rapidly expand. At the same time, unemployment was rising, wages were at an all-time low, and stock prices were not their actual value. And the agriculture industry was dealing with drought issues, so the economy was set up to fail. A mild recession occurred in 1929, but stock prices continued to go up. On October 24, 1929, as nervous investors began selling overpriced shares en masse, the stock market crash that, had, that some had feared happened at last. A record 12.9 million shares were traded that day known as Black Thursday. Five days later, on October 29th, or Black Tuesday, some 16 million shares were traded after another wave of panic swept Wall Street. Millions of shares ended up worthless, and those investors who had bought stocks on margin, or with borrowed money, were wiped out completely. As the recession grew worse and worse, industrial production decreased by half. There were a growing number of people unemployed, and the agricultural industry were having significant issues as harvesting crops were to expense. In the fall of 1930, the first of four waves of banking panics began, as large numbers of investors lost confidence in the solvency of their banks and demanded deposits in cash, forcing banks to liquidate loans in order to supplement their insufficient cash reserves on hand. Bank runs swept the United States again in the spring and the fall of 1931 and the fall of 1932, and by the early 1933, thousands of banks had closed their doors. This is the first graph we'll be using throughout this project. It's the U.S. unemployment rate between 1930 and 1945. And as you can see, during the Great Depression, unemployment rates were sky high, reaching almost 25% in 1933. Things did start to get better, however, as the Great Depression started to end and World War II started to begin. However, it just shows how unstable the economy was at this time. Before we get into what is the main point of this project, and that is the alternative theory of what may have fixed the Great Depression, we have to look at the two most popular ways of thinking about the Great Depression, as that is either solved by economic policy with the help of Keynesian economics or by World War II itself. And here we have a graphic of the social impact of the Great Depression and the New Deal. So this would fall under the economic policy before the war itself. And as you can see, this is a quote by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, I pledge you, I pledge myself to a New Deal for the American people as he may have not agreed with Keynesian or John Maynard Keynes and Keynesian economics, he certainly did implement some policies that kind of followed that throughout his time as president in order to fix the economy, especially before World War II happened itself. The first one we're going to be talking about is World War II as a fixer for the Depression, and it's relatively simple to understand. There was a huge increase in GDP or gross domestic product at this time due to the production of military equipment such as tanks, planes, and ships. And it's relatively easy to understand this, as because if you're fighting a war and you need tanks, planes, and ships to continue fighting, you're also going to need people to fight with these weapons. And you're also going to need people to build these weapons. So for that reason, unemployment rates were extremely low during this time. And it allowed for people to create a stable income for themselves. And if they have a stable income and they're able to feed their families, that means they're also able to spend their disposable income on other things, which keeps the economy going. Economic policy before the war is, according to some economists, one of the biggest reasons as to why the Great Depression ended. 
Programs like the WPA, or the Works Projects Agencies, helped to give millions of people jobs between 1935 and 1943, and that number was around 8.5 million. This allowed people who were otherwise unemployed to have a stable income and to have a job so they could feed and then spend their money on other things that their families need. Another reason is the multiplier effect, and the multiplier effect can be looked at like this. If the government's going to spend $100,000 to build a bridge, then they're going to spend that money by hiring a contracting firm, and then they're going to give that money to them for building the bridge. The contracting firm is then going to pay its workers wages out of that money, and then those workers, in turn, are going to spend their money throughout the economy on other things that they need. Then the money continues to go through the economic system, and this is what the multiplier effect essentially does. Another reason for this is Social Security, and what Social Security was is for the first time in nation's history, allowed people to receive benefits such as unemployment, and this significantly helped out people who were otherwise not able to find a job so they could earn money or at least get some money to help feed and fend for their families as they otherwise had no means to do it. Tax cuts is another one that's fairly obvious, as because if taxes are cut, there's more of people's income they're able to spend. Although, as we've learned with a few quizzes, with tax cuts, especially ones that are only temporary, people may see this as a reason to save more of their money that they get back from these tax cuts instead of spend it, due to reasons such as that they think that these taxes are going to have to be eventually repaid as they're temporary. Now, while that's still controversial, in the short run, a lot of times, the people do spend more of their money when taxes are cut. Increased government spending is also fairly obvious as it allows the gap to be filled so full employment can be reached. For the rest of this project, we'll be talking about what is the main point, and that is the article written by Peter Ferreira of Forbes magazine, and it's called The Great Depression Was Ended by the End of World War II. And why this article is really important is it because it provides a third reason, example, or theory as to why the Great Depression was fixed. And this, this entire theory is especially interesting because it kind of goes away from traditional thinking in terms of the information that it provides and the reasoning for stuff. And he uses quite a few different examples from people other than his own research and himself to explain this. And I think that the way it's written and the way that he presents his information is really fantastic because it's easy to understand for someone that may not be in advanced thinking as he is. The one thing to note before we get into actually going in depth into this article is that he seems to really have a vendetta against Keynesian economics and people that follow this. I think that while he's very blunt in what he thinks about these said people, it is really interesting to see how charismatic he is about what he's writing and how much he believes in what he is doing. And I, I think that that makes it easier for me to read because he's being honest. He also seems to be very conservative in his economic thinking and does not really like much of government spending in terms of creating more economic growth um, to the point where he sometimes insults people who agree with this. But I think that while his thinking is may not entirely true, it is especially interesting. So getting into this article, we're going to first go into the part where he argues the Great Depression being ended by economic spending by the government is a fallacy. And what he essentially says by that is that while a lot of people such as Keynesian economics or Keynesians as they're sometimes called – believe that the Great Depression was in part ended because of a ton of government spending, either by the war or by the projects such as the Works Progress Administration. But he believes that the, it's a fallacy, that economic spending actually took longer for the Great Depression to end. I mean, government spending took longer for the Great Depression to end. So another reason for what he states is World War II actually made standards of living worse, and that's one of the reasons why he considers this to be – I consider this to be a different way of looking at this problem because he states that while the economics on paper may look better because of GDP and unemployment, the standards of living were actually worse because of the war itself, and it's because of either rationing, as you can see in this photo here that there is more meat going to war or there is gas rations or food rations where I know for example that wives and such that were trying to find food for their families for the supper or for lunch or something had to actually kind of double manage their money in terms of there was actually stamps they had to carry around that were a point system and there was actually monetary value in items in the store and they had to go between different stores to actually find the items they could buy with their points and with their money. So just because you had money didn't necessarily mean you could buy all of the meat or all of the gas you wanted because of this rationing. Um, and he also argues that the Depression was actually ended and prosperity restored by the sharp reductions in spending and taxes and regulation at the end of World War II, exactly contrary to the analysis of Keynesian so-called economics. And again, you can see that little punch in the stomach that he does at the end of that sentence there towards Keynesian economics. But this is essentially his thesis statement in that Sharp reductions in spending, tax, and regulation at the end of World War II 
kind of allowed for prosperity and the depression to end and be restored in terms of prosperity. So continuing on with this article, he then states that unemployment did decline, but it was statistical residue as an effect from the war. And what he means by that is because of the war, these people have jobs. The soldiers have jobs and people working in the factories have jobs. Now, if there was no war, these people would not have jobs. He then argues that while GDP did rise, it was at the result of all military equipment being added to the GDP. And it did not reflect the standards of living of what people were experiencing at the time, because typically as GDP rises, standards of living rise with it, and at this time, they were not doing so. He then argues that a better economic value of military equipment would be by subtracting the cost of the equipment from GDP. And you can see by the graph here that how much GDP increased from 1939 between 1944 there. And as you can see that during this time, that while GDP was significantly increasing, it was at the result of the military production during the war because from 1939 and even a little bit before that, the United States was creating military equipment to send to the Allies, such as Russia, the United Kingdom, and for a very brief period of time before France fell, France. And eventually producing their own, as you can see, when it comes to be the highest around 1942, 1943, and 1944. And as you can see that directly after the war, which we will talk about in the next few slides, it actually began to increase again. Ferrer then compares wars in America's past to the economic significance of World War II. Examples such as the American Civil War, Mexican-American War, and Vietnam War, and argues that whether or not wars themselves are net additions to or net subtractions from American GDP. He then argues that increased government spending does not help economic recovery because the money to finance the increased government spending is derived from the private sector, either through taxes or increased borrowing. And taxes drain investment capital and redistribute the money to non-productive government consumption. Ferreira then states, if demand for any good or service is insufficient to buy up all the available supply, the price for the good or service will decline, increasing demand and reducing supply until they're equal. The way he explains this idea is by introducing the book, The Information Theory of Capitalism, How It's Revolutionizing Our World by George Gilder. Not only introduced George Gilder's book as a way of explaining his ideas, but as a way to explain this idea and a few others further. So the quote that he uses is, after World War II, when 10 million demobilized servicemen returned to an economy that had been converted from a garrison state to civilian needs, such as actually a war economy back to a civilian economy, economists steeled themselves for a renewed depression. A sweeping Republican victory in the congressional election of 1946, however, brought an end to the wartime government planning regime, or overregulation, dropping from 42% of the GDP to 14%. Government spending plummeted by a total of 61% between 1945 and 1947. 150,000 government regulators were laid off, along with perhaps a million other civilian employees of the government. The War Production Board, the War Labor Board, and the Office of Price Administration were dismantled. So these next two quotes I'm about to display are what made me do this article as my project, and what made me really do this idea as the main point around my project. And what it really led me to believe is the wow moment in terms of what made me actually think that this article and this idea itself, this theory, actually makes sense. And it, it is so important, I think, on an economic standpoint to actually know this. And for me, I learned something. After reading these two quotes, I had never known this existed before. And what it was is that Keynesian economists, economists believe that after World War II has ended and a decrease in government spending was bound to happen, the economy could go back to either being the Great Depression or actually potentially worse than what it would be. And this is something I never knew because in all the history I've ever took and all the research I've ever done in the past, I always thought that the economy, everybody thought everything's going to be A-OK -okay as soon as the war ended because the Great Depression was over. So what this quote really shows is this. Every Keynesian economist confidently predicted doom sounding exactly like his future student, Paul Krugman, who would beg Obama for trillions in additional stimulus spending, Paul Samuelson in 1945 prophesied the greatest period of unemployment and dislocation any economy has ever faced. Arnold Kling of the Cato Institute observed that as a percentage of GDP, the decrease in government purchases was larger than would result from the total elimination of government today. As, Krug as Paul Krugman points out, Nominal GDP, as measured by economists, did drop a record 20.6% in 1946 when government spending plummeted. As soon as I read this article, I, I was didn't read any more, obviously, because this is the first quote that I saw in, in regards to this. It was like, oh my god, that, that sounds absolutely terrible. I mean, 20.6% of nominal GDP would fall. That's, that is pretty crazy. But then he starts to show in this next quote why he completely disagrees with that and actually thinks that it will improve which, as I will prove to you in the next two slides, it actually did.
The next quote is, but a drop in government spending after a war does not depress creativity. It unleashes it. Judging the public sector contribution by its cost is the great error of Keynesian economics. The Great Depression, which had continued through the war, disguised by price controls and necessary defense spending, as Peter Ferreira has actually showed us throughout what he has talked about in his article, at last came to an end. Because there was no more defense spending boosting the GDP to the levels that we've seen, and there was no more or very much less in terms of rations, economic growth could then surge by 10% over two years, and the civilian labor force expanded by 7 million workers after the war had ended. The private sector launched a 10-year boom despite self-defeating tax rates on investors as high as 91%. The Republican Congress compensated for the high rates by introducing joint returns, effectively cutting taxes in half for intact families. Corporate taxes dropped drastically, and the tax burden measured by the government spending fell more dramatically than any other time in American history. Law inflation, or low inflation and privatization led to a resurgence of large manufacturing corporations, especially added for low-logic voters. And what this really shows is that while everybody else that was a Keynesian economist believed that there was going to be another economic downturn, especially because of the decrease in economic spending, that in fact there actually wasn't, and the economy actually continued it, at first, it, it hit when it hit a wall, but eventually it would go back up. And as I'll show you in the next slide, there's actually statistical proof to show this. So if we look back at what they predicted as a 20% drop in GDP, it is obviously able to – or 20.6% drop in nominal GDP it is obviously able to be seen in 1946 that that is true. As you can see here, that there was a absolutely substantial drop in 1946. And even in a little bit in 1945 as well, as the war was coming down – coming to a close and eventually, especially throughout the latter half of 1945, there was no more war. As you can see though, there was then an increase in 1947. Another very small decrease in 1948, but then over the next 10 years, there was a static pretty much increase, except for a few outlier years, but there was a significant increase instead of the predicted huge downturn that Keynesian economists predicted. This can also be seen by, if we look back at the quote where they said, one of the worst unemployment rates in history was bound to happen, it actually didn't go back that much farther over pre-Great Depression levels. It bounced around between a couple percentages, around 5% staying close if not at full employment and staying there for quite a long time and obviously there is going to be a large increase in unemployment especially after 10 million service members come home and do not currently have jobs as the military no longer needs 10 million soldiers and all those factories producing those tanks ships and guns and planes and everything else do not currently need to be producing them anymore and need to find other sources for their input or for their output especially another thing that could have increased this is something like the aviation industry for example, a lot of America's bombers and a lot of America's Air Force could be converted to aviation in terms of airlines. For example, some of the pressurized cabins such that had to be researched and produced throughout the war can then be immediately produced into factories for producing commercial airlines, which actually did happen throughout the 1950s and such as commercial flights started to become very popular. And this could be just another little example of explaining why that some of this unemployment is not as bad as some of the people predicted. While Keynesian economists believed there was going to be a downturn after, directly after the war, there actually was something called post-war expansion that ended up happening between about 1950 and 1973, also called the golden age of capitalism, in which people of all different income levels started to see their wealth and their income levels grow. And in, a lot of reasons for this actually happening is not just because of infrastructure spending, wealth redistribution, technological advances and such that help produce outside the production possibilities frontier curve, but things such as Keynesian economics themselves as governments actually learn to develop and to adopt some of their policies and continue to use them throughout the rest of their economy, such as with Social Security and such sticking even after the war was over, after the Great Depression had ended. So while they had once predicted that there was going to be a huge economic downturn, the actual opposite happened in the next couple of decades. Here's just some of the articles I used, and I'm not exactly sure how in a video format I'd provide these links to you. So what I did was I used screen recording to show all of the articles. As you can see here, they can all be scrolling through if you click on them. And I also provide the links in one of the following slides. But here is just all of the articles that I mainly used for my research. Um, there's a couple more that I used in terms of just getting some quick facts, but these are the main articles I used for research.
So in summary, I learned something completely new about the Great Depression, which, like I said, is one of the most interesting things in terms of like economics. Like when I think of economics and when we talk about monetary and fiscal policy in class, I think that I always think about the Great Depression. As I think it's – with history repeats itself, and it's the most studyable thing is history in terms of learning from your mistakes. And I think that when we talked about and we did that video in class, it really just increased my interest in doing this as a project. Um, and with this, while a lot of this is extremely advanced in terms of – especially my economic thinking as I know this is just an intro to economics kind of class in terms of just macroeconomics on a basic level, I think that even if some of the things that we went over in this person, Peter Ferreira, who actually seems like a very credible economist, actually said, while they may not all be true and while I may disagree some of them with on a personal level just because of – I still kind of think that it makes sense with the multiplier effect and government spending. And while he may disagree with that, I think that on some level it's a very good thing in terms of – especially from what we've learned in class. But I think that even if it's not all correct, I think that I learned something from – doing this project and doing that as my project because I learned another way of looking at someone else's ideas and trying to explain them to somebody else. And I think that that helps me learn what they're really trying to say and where they come from and what they're saying. And while, like I said, there is an obvious bias to what he says and he seems to have a hatred for Keynesian economists and for people of liberal economic thinking, I think that – they could be seen that way, but I also think it can be seen the way how charismatic Peter Ferrer is and what he's writing. And yeah, I think that that is – I think that this article was – it was just awesome. I, I don't know why. As soon as I read this article, I became instantly attached to it. I, so anyways, this is the last slide and what we're going to talk about for this project. So this is the last slide that I'll have on this project, and it's just a couple of the links that I use to get research or to get quick facts throughout this project. So as you can see, most of these were included in the article slide, but I just want to provide them like a works cited form. Um, and as this is the last slide on this project, and the last time I'll probably be able to say something to you, I just wanted to thank you for having an amazing class. Um, one of the things that you said in one of the first classes, which is this will change your way of thinking, like in general, not just about economics. I think that stuck with me the entire time because every time I think about a problem now, I kind of think about what's my opportunity cost of doing this over this and stuff like that. So it's just – I've never thought that way before, and it's something that I completely agree with now when you say that it changed your thinking. And I guess that's kind of why I wanted to do what I believe would be a tougher subject. Like I could have gone out and I could have done something along the lines of – like what I originally said, just comparing and contrasting those two relatively easier ideas. But when I saw – a new idea out there. I kind of said, you know what? I want to take the risk and I want to try and do this new idea or try to learn about this because I think that if I've learned one thing from this class, it's different way of thinking and I really think that it's 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 cool now to be able to read these articles that are a little bit more advanced and I may not understand everything or even close to everything on some of these articles. I think that I understand way more than I used to and I can kind of actually interpret and think about, you know, why is this person saying this? Is this are these facts real, you know? And think about all the economic principles and such as the production possibilities frontier and supply and demand and on a more mature level and I think that that's what I've really learned from this class. So I just wanted to say thank you again and sorry for making this almost doubled the length now at 23 minutes and 14 seconds as I'm talking. Um, but uh, like I said, I just tried to want to explain what I've learned and what this project was about and what this article was about because like I said, it was very interesting. So thank you. I hope you have a really nice summer, and I hope to talk to you soon. So have a nice day.